Welcome to Arab Center, Washington, D.C. Uh, this is Khalid Jashan, Executive Director of the Center, and we're having a conversation uh, today uh, regarding uh, coronavirus and, and, and the uh, impact of this outbreak globally on, on the issue uh, of uh, human rights, civil rights, uh, freedom of expression, uh, and what have you, with an emphasis probably on, of course, our area, which is the uh, Arab world. Our special guest today is uh, Charles Dunn. Charles is a, a colleague at Arab Center Washington. Uh, he is a non-resident fellow uh, at the center. He, of course, uh, served as a U.S. diplomat for 24 years uh, with several tours, uh, actually, in the uh, region, including uh, key positions in Cairo and, and Jerusalem. Uh, he served uh, after leaving the State Department as director of uh, the Middle East uh, and North Africa programs uh, at uh, Freedom House, uh, an organization that is specifically uh, focused on these uh, issues that we are discussing uh, today. Also, during his government career, he was a foreign policy uh, advisor uh, in terms of uh, policy planning and at State Department and the joint staff uh, at the uh, Pentagon. Uh, Charles, uh, welcome. I uh, appreciate you taking time uh, during this uh, coronavirus crisis. We're, mm -hmm. we're all prisoners at home uh, in a way, and we appreciate the fact that we're able uh, to join uh, uh, via technology, if you will, online uh, to have this uh, discussion. Uh, let me begin basically by uh, saying that uh, certainly it's very clear as governments uh, are uh, reacting uh, to this abnormal uh, historic uh, crisis, uh, uh, they seem to be kind of taking permission, uh, if you will, in, in terms of increasing uh, or maximizing their executive powers uh, to the detriment of what we are accustomed to as civil rights, civil liberties, uh, freedom uh, of the press, and, and, and so on. And is this a universal trend or is it limited uh, to, let's say, de democratic versus non-democratic uh, countries uh, and so on from your perspective? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, good morning and th thanks for having me, uh, Khalil and Iman. Uh, I appreciate your uh, taking the time uh, to do this. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great question because no, I don't think uh, the, say, let us say the authoritarian impulse in reaction to the coronavirus crisis uh, is limited to illiberal democracies, populist leaderships. Uh, it's also, you know, extends to uh, countries who are already authoritarian in nature uh, and seek to capitalize on this crisis to extend uh, the, uh, you know, depth of uh, their rule. Um, now, a lot has been written about the assault on democracies uh, because of the coronavirus crisis. And, you know, Exhibit A these days uh, is Hungary, where Viktor Orban has essentially suspended parliament, given himself the right to suspend laws. Uh, the judiciary is already effectively under his control, and people are calling this the first coronavirus autocracy um, uh, in the world. But you have plenty of other examples where countries, uh, not only in the Middle East, but including in the Middle East, uh, have used this uh, to uh, crack down on uh, popular dissent. And I, I think, you know, we may be seeing the beginning of, uh, of a wave of this uh, that's starting just now, really. Uh, joining us also is uh, Dr. Ahmad uh, Harb, uh, my colleague from uh, the center who directs uh, our research uh, department. Uh, Ahmad, uh, please go ahead, and uh, if you have any questions for Charles, please proceed. Uh, thank you, Khalil, and uh, welcome, Charles, to this interview, uh, this conversation, rather. Um, we appreciate you joining us. Uh, uh, the, uh, yes, you know, the trend uh, has been that uh, authoritarian governments uh, do what they want to do to, to survive or uh, to uh, basically uh, deepen their control over society. Um, in the Arab world, uh, this is something that you have uh, just uh, written about for us, and uh, your paper will be up this afternoon, I think. Um, in the Arab world, uh, there has been 
there have been some countries who have actually did who did use it uh, use the coronavirus to clamp down on uh, society. Uh, could you just uh, generally just uh, have a some sort of a general look at uh, which government did what, and uh, you know as briefly as you can? Sure. Um, the one I focus on a lot in the paper is is Egypt, um, which seems to have taken a lot of its political cues on how to handle this crisis from China. The uh, health minister was immediately dispensed to China, where I don't know what epidemiological advice she got there, but she certainly. Uh, took the opportunity to express solidarity with the Chinese, which was very much highlighted uh, in the Chinese media. And also the same political message was delivered, you know, three days after she went there uh, at a joint Chinese-Egyptian uh, conference in which the politics of the issue were very much emphasized. Uh, and the theme was China's indispensability, not only to solving this crisis, but to its political and economic role in the world. Now, the CC government doesn't need much encouragement to crack down on its political opponents. And one of my points here is that um, authoritarian governments in the Middle East uh, don't have a long way to go uh, to deepen their repression. But, you know, they certainly do take some cues from these other countries and uh, on, 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 on how to do this. So, for example, in Egypt, uh, uh, President Sisi uh, and his government uh, immediately threw out the, Gar the Guardian correspondent, the British newspaper, for having reported accurately on a Canadian study, which said the Egyptian government had understated the number of coronavirus cases. Uh, they warned the New York Times correspondent. Um, they uh, subsequently jailed a number of activists for speaking out on the coronavirus crisis. And uh, the minister for Al-Khaf uh, endowments uh, denounced uh, the coronavirus crisis as part of a, part of a conspiracy uh, and accused the Muslim Brotherhood of trying to spread it. Now, obviously, they've already cracked down on the Muslim Brotherhood, but this provides one more excuse to keep the tens of thousands of Muslim Brotherhood uh, you know, opposition that's in jail uh, without a trial, where, by the way, there's a serious risk of mass uh, infection of the political or the political prisoner population there. Um, and, um, you know, they have uh, taken the opportunity to spread other conspiracy theories uh, designed, in fact, I think, to generally draw attention away from the failings of the government in other areas. This is another major use of the coronavirus crisis. You see this in Iran as well. Uh, one other example that I just give you is in Algeria, um, the government has specifically called on the protesters who have been in the streets demanding political change over the course of more than a year to get out and stop making political demands because this is not helpful uh, in the middle of this crisis. So here you see how some of these governments are overtly or less overtly sort of using this to discourage or delegitimize uh, political dissent. Uh, and I, you know, I think that's, as I said in the beginning, I think this is a trend that will likely accelerate as the pandemic accelerates. Uh, you Charles, know, you uh, alluded to the, uh, the fact that the, the uh, leadership in different countries, both democratic and non-democratic, uh, seem to be kind of, uh, first of all, hiding uh, behind this crisis uh, to cover up uh, their shortcomings, past and present mm -hmm. and probably future. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, but at, at the same time, they seem to be uh, taking advantage uh, of uh, this crisis uh, by the fact that no one is complaining. Everybody is still kind of in shock, uh, whether internally or externally, so that they're not getting a lot of complaints, if you will. Uh, regarding some of the steps they have uh, taken. But to me, what's so surprising is uh, uh, some countries, uh, you kind of, in a way, did not anticipate that. For example, here at home, uh, I was surprised by the Justice de Department going to Capitol Hill and attempting to try to expand, if you will, some of the authorities of the Justice Department and, and uh, law enforcement uh, taking advantage of this crisis and the fear that uh, comes with it uh, mm -hmm. to try to uh, expand their authorities be beyond what has been defined uh, as normal, even in cases of emergencies. Uh, 
uh, like this one here in the United States. This is worrisome, isn't it? Yeah, it is very worrisome. And uh, I, I, you know, I would say that this is a impulse that obviously is not unique um, to authoritarian countries or populist, uh, you know, democracies. Uh, and you see these very worrisome strains in the United States as well. And it's a common theme where uh, governments, uh, democratic or illiberal, uh, try to use this as an excuse to expand powers or to push um, pet policies, such as, for example, construction of the border wall along uh, the U.S.-Mexico border, uh, under the guise of addressing uh, the coronavirus crisis. This is something that has to be guarded against in our, in, our, in our own society. But at the same time, we have to pay attention to its impact uh, overseas and among our, our, our key allies. Let me give you another example. I mean, Saudi Arabia and Israel have both shut down their court systems for who knows how long, an indefinite period, uh, because there's a risk of uh, contagion if trials are held, people are in close proximity, and so on. Okay, a lot of these measures have actual public health uses, even if they seem undemocratic, but at the same time, it's a double-edged sword. So that, uh, for example, in Saudi Arabia, um, you have political activists uh, who are unable to come to trial. Their court dates, they've already been in jail in some cases for years uh, without trial. That's now postponed indefinitely. So there's definitely an upside uh, for an authoritarian government, for example, um, by taking some of these measures that can be seen as in the public health interest. Uh, you referred to, to Israel as another case, and it is somewhat surprising, particularly uh, specifically with the issue you just raised. Mm -hmm. uh, the court system uh, in Israel has generally been kind of left alone. It does toe the line when it comes to national security uh, beyond what is common in, in democracies. Uh, however, uh, this time, uh, I mean, shutting the system to, uh, in, in a way under the guise of responding uh, to this coronavirus uh, outbreak in, in order to prevent being uh, brought to justice himself. Uh, the prime minister is being accused uh, by the uh, civil rights movement in Israel and, and uh, by many activists and, and, and NGOs and by the media in general of basically uh, orchestrating almost a, a, a corona coup uh, in, in the country, you know, taking steps that are totally unprecedented historically in that country. Right. Well, it's, again, it, this is one of these examples where you do have a democracy, which has certain populist tendencies, especially among the current uh, political leadership or illiberal tendencies, however you want to, to phrase that. And you can certainly make a case that some of the things that uh, the prime minister has been doing does have a public health purpose. But again, it also has a uh, strong political purpose. The use of cell phone data, for example, to track, uh, to track the spread of the pandemic and people's contacts in order to uh, you know, minimize the spread. Uh, you can make a public health case for that. But it does have civil libertarians in Israel very worried that this kind of surveillance uh, goes beyond its original purpose. And, and more importantly, could also be extended beyond the length of the pandemic. And that's one of the things I think we really have to worry about. How many of these measures that are being taken today are going to continue well beyond the expiration of the crisis? And in my paper, I mentioned the state of emergency in Egypt, for example, that was imposed after Sadat's assassination. It lasted 31 years uh, during the whole of Mubarak's uh, regime, uh, was briefly suspended and then reinstated 17 different times uh, since then, again, under the guise of, of fighting terrorism. But it certainly defines terrorism very broadly uh, to include uh, political opposition, right? So this is the concern to a certain extent in Israel, and it should be a concern as we look at civil and human rights uh, in every country in the Middle East as it faces uh, this coronavirus epidemic. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, Charles, about the Iranian case. I mean, this is uh, this is a regime that really has, uh, as far as I'm, um, uh, as far as I know, has actually failed to really combat this this virus. 
but uh, it also has uh, had some sort of a uh, almost like you know it, it probably didn't feel like it can really impose anything because there is so much religious uh, belief in, uh, behind all the, all the uh, stuff that's going on so mm -hmm. i mean what what is what's your take on the iranian case well, I think my take on the Iranian case is that they're, uh, first of all, the hardest hit country in the, in the Middle East. And part of that is the, uh, you know, the regime's infrastructure, uh, both health-wise and politically, is simply unequipped to handle a pandemic uh, of this nature. And, you know, their natural impulse politically is, when faced with a crisis like this, is to deny, to obfuscate, to peddle conspiracy theories and to crack down and they've done all of these things in, right. in, in, in this case. Now you're right, they're also facing um, you know, broad religious impulses. I mean, people who want to worship at shrines, shrines right. have to be shut down. This creates a certain amount of civil unrest. You've seen exactly the same thing in Iraq, for example, where people are literally storming closed shrines because they want to worship there and they don't see what the reason is that they, they can't. And so this is part of the failing of the authoritarian response, right? That right. the Iranian authorities are unable to um, tell the truth, um, tell the people what the facts are, provide a convincing rationale for what it is they're doing, and instead relying on conspiracy theories, one of which, for example, is that the coronavirus was created uh, by right. the United States to yeah, right. specifically to target Iranians. Um, and you've heard a similar version of this conspiracy theory in various other parts of the world, including in right-wing media here in the United States. But in this case, you know, it was China who created it. Right. Um, so, you know, this really highlights the, the, the problems with the authoritarian impulse. Even though authoritarian states are going to try to use this to showcase how well they're doing, how well their system can right. operate in response to this. But, you know, the, as, the Thor, as the Iranian case clearly shows, there are glaring shortcomings in all of this. You know, and once again, Iran, of course, is trying to use this crisis and its crackdowns to, you know, draw attention away from all of the issues that brought tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands you know, of Iranians into the streets protesting just a few months ago, all of the various failings of the regime. Right, that's correct. Um, uh, the, uh, I wanted to just, uh, you, you have written for us before on Morocco. You know, Morocco has supposedly uh, mm -hmm. uh, succeeded in, uh, in having some sort of a good public relation, not public relation, but a public campaign uh, mm -hmm. to really try to limit the effect of the, uh, of the coronavirus. But still, I mean, you, you, you look at, uh, yeah, they succeeded in trying to limit the, uh, the spread, but at the same time, the Mahzen and the king are still mm -hmm. in charge, and uh, they probably will use this to, uh, you know, maintain, uh, maintain their rule. What, 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 do you, what do you look at? How, how do you look at that? Well, yes. I mean, I think they have the same impulses as uh, any other, you know, top-down, more or less authoritarian state in, in dealing with. Um, they do have a public health responsibility and to a certain extent are trying uh, to exercise it. You know, for example, shutting down fake news, claims of cures, criticism right. of the government, you know, criticism that there is no virus, there is no crisis. Okay, well, um, that's laudable to a certain extent, but is it also laudable to throw people in jail for expressing these opinions? Right. Um, so again, it's a two-edged sword. Um, they have tried uh, to use uh, uh, the, um, uh, the virus uh, crisis to shut down public protest, again, serving a public health purpose. But on the other hand, uh, it also serves a purpose about getting people out of the streets when there's been quite an uptick uh, in protests uh, against the regime on a number of grounds, including the repression in, in, in the reef and the arrest of journalists uh, and, and, and so on. So, I mean, this, this, is a, this is a case where they're responding on two levels. One is epidemiological uh, and one is, is, is political and how that's gonna play out, especially when the crisis shows signs of ebbing and people have the uh, opportunity for a little retrospective. 
I mean, that's going to be a very interesting case, as it, I think, is going to be in, uh, in the case of many of these countries. And people are already talking about this in, in, in China. You know, what is the future of uh, Chinese Communist Party rule, given the fact that there's a lot more criticism coming out uh, about their response right now? That's very interesting, Charles, what you just mentioned about the uh, Moroccan uh, experience. Uh, but uh, in a way, that has been kind of regional, uh, more than just one or two mm -hmm. uh, countries. I mean, the, the coronavirus outbreak uh, has been bad news uh, to civil rights in the Arab world in general, and particularly what mm -hmm. you just uh, referred to, uh, all the this, uh, demonstrations and, and uh, uh, movements that have emerged over the past year or two seeking uh, a light at the end of the tunnel in terms of their freedoms and, and basic rights. Uh, all that had to stop, uh, mm -hmm. e even voluntarily in a way, in addition to the oppressive nature and restrictive uh, steps uh, and measures uh, taken by the, by the government. So it's been somewhat of a of kind of unforeseen if you will, impact of this crisis uh, on, on civil rights. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, many of these movements, I mean, people are, for example, in Iraq, they're still going out and demonstrating, right? And, and they've, they've had calls of you know, coronavirus, come visit us and get rid of our corrupt politicians. But, okay, so that hasn't stopped protests there uh, completely. But of course, there have been calls for people to stop going into the streets. Um, I think there's a sense that public disapprobation of this level of protest for health reasons um, may drive more Iraqis from the streets. And of course, Muqtada Sadr called on people to, to get out of the streets. Now is not the time for protest. So this has really had a chilling effect, I think, overall on, on uh, a lot of these movements. It's put them on pause in some cases. And, you know, in a way, it's not dissimilar to what we see in the United States where you know, what happened to the presidential campaign? Where's that gone? I heard there's a democratic primary going on, but you know, it's online uh, now. And uh, that whole thing has been put aside. I mean, not for authoritarian reasons, uh, but, but you can see how politics as normal just can continue. And if you are trying to press an entrenched government to get out of power or make basic changes, I mean, this is really bad news for you on a lot of levels. Yeah, Matt? So, uh, I, I want to just uh, uh, refer to the Lebanese case even. I mean, you know, over the last two or three days, uh, Lebanese police have uh, gone down to downtown Beirut and, uh, and really burned the, uh, the tents of the protesters there uh, you know, on the, uh, on the, with, with, with the virus as an excuse that uh, they, don't want, they don't want people... Uh, you know, gathering uh, because uh, this will uh, spread the virus. Although the protesters were actually uh, maintaining uh, vigilance about mm -hmm. this, uh, staying staying as uh, far away from each other as possible. But still, mm -hmm. even in Lebanon, they used it to crack down on the protesters. Yeah, I mean that's that's a perfect example of where the government can make a semi plausible excuse for an essentially political act. And uh, with the with the intent of wrecking uh, that that public protest movement. And again, nobody knows how long this pandemic is going to go on. But the longer it does, the more such measures are going to take place. Right. And again, the risk is that they will be remaining in place, probably under the guise of presenting preventing a, a second wave of COVID nineteen, uh, and that could go on for years. Right. Uh, Charles, let me ask you about that, uh, the, the long-term uh, implications of this crisis to civil rights and human rights, uh, particularly in, in the Arab world. Uh, the, sh the, the probably most positive scenario is that that would end within a few weeks. But are we, should that be the case, that within a couple of months, things begin to taper down? Uh, but we're stuck with a lot of these measures, uh, probably that would be much more lasting, as you just uh, implied, uh, than anticipated. Is that going to be a challenge for the United States, for U.S. policy in the region, particularly when it entails some allies of, of Washington who have taken these steps and most probably will resist uh, giving him up uh, should the crisis be relatively short-lived? 
Yeah, look, I would say that this is a major policy challenge for Washington. If I thought that Washington were interested in taking up the policy challenge, um, from what we've seen over the last couple of years, you know, human rights and uh, civic liberties are way down the list of the administration's priorities in the region. And I think this crisis really risks driving it off the agenda altogether. I think the administration will be all too willing to overlook, as you know, as it has in the past, largely, uh, major violations of, of human rights and will accept at face value uh, claims by governments that we have to maintain, you know, political distancing measures, uh, if you will, indefinitely because of the risk of, of further contagion, maintaining civil, civil order, dealing overall with the economic crisis, uh, dealing with, uh, you know, this has opened up a whole fertile ground for terrorism and radicalization. We have to maintain all of these measures to stave all of this off. I think it's going to find um, a very uh, uh, welcome ear in Washington. Um, if we had an administration that, on the other hand, saw this as a challenge, I mean, I, I think there's many things that it could do, uh, in, including admonishing governments, uh, you know, not to take advantage of this. That the United States will be watching and is willing to pressure them publicly uh, to maintain only those measures that are necessary for public health reasons. The United States actually has a huge opportunity for leadership, not only on the health front, the pandemic front, but on the political front to try to help organize democracies to respond to this uh, and to help suspend some of these regional political feuds and wars that are getting in the way of pandemic response. Um, if the United States did that, I think some good politically and diplomatically could come out of this whole crisis. But to me, at the moment, there's no sign that this is being taken seriously or even being considered as an issue. Uh, do you see any positive role for Congress in this regard? I mean, should the administration continue, if you will, to, to show some hesitation mm -hmm. in confronting that because it's played its full and mm -hmm. it doesn't want to antagonize allies at these difficult times? Is there a role for Congress uh, as, a, as, if you will, the conscience of the American people in, in, in presenting uh, our case uh, in defense of civil liberties and human rights? Yeah, I mean, I think Congress can play a major role in doing this. And, you know, there's a certain congressional constituency for pressuring uh, countries like Egypt and Saudi Arabia that are seen to be violating human rights. Uh, in fact, uh, legislation has been introduced to sharply reduce aid to Egypt on account of the, uh, the death in prison of the American citizen uh, recently. It doesn't seem to have much of a future, but we'll follow it closely and we'll see. So there are voices in Congress that can do this, but they're distracted by the pandemic just like everybody else is. And in fact, the, you know, the social distancing measures that are enforced in, in Congress, uh, you know, as you've seen in the voice vote on the $2 trillion bailout package, uh, really hampers the Congress's ability to do business. So as I say, they're distracted too, but they haven't forgotten about the importance of human rights in, in the Middle East. And their attention uh, will be drawn back to this, particularly as the administration's glaring refusal to deal with this, even perhaps after the worst of the crisis is gone, as that uh, glaring inability to focus on that becomes even more clear, I think Congress has a huge opening to play a major role. Uh, Charles, uh, if, if you can just uh, extrapolate a little bit on uh, uh, whether this virus, uh, and uh, I know this is definitely uh, uh, speculation on, more on your part, but then it could be very, very interesting. Um, uh, the, uh, to, trying to deal with this virus in, the, in Iraq, for instance, how is that going to be influencing how Iran influences affairs in Iraq? Well, I think the virus is going to hamper everybody's ability uh, to do business. Uh, I think as if it happens that Iran begins to turn inward a bit to focus on this, its ability to control affairs, if you will, in Iraq uh, is going to be uh, hampered as well. Um, it's, it's very difficult to say how this is uh, going to go uh, going forward. But I, I, I think as a general point, um, some of the adventurism that we've seen on the part of Iran and that we've seen on part of the Gulf countries in 
uh, Yemen, for example, is, is going to become more difficult to carry out. Uh, if for no other reason, then resources have to be diverted uh, to the pandemic response. Um, so I think that will be a very interesting thing uh, to take a look at going forward. Um, I guess I guess we can uh, also say the same thing about the Iranian influence in Syria, for instance, or involvement in Syria, right? Yeah, I, I think so. And you know, depending on how far the uh, pandemic spreads in Syria, that can have an actual major impact on on military operations. Uh, right. You know, we've seen it on the U.S. aircraft carrier. Uh, in, in the Pacific already. And, you know, you remember that the 1918 uh, in Spanish influenza epidemic really started in the trenches of Europe with all those men packed closely together uh, fighting, uh, fighting World War I, and it spread from there. Um, you know, that's, that should be a real concern if you happen to be a military planner of any country and you're fighting in Syria. And that impact, uh, I don't think, is seen immediately, but we may see it. Uh, down the road with interesting implications for Syria's political future. Thank you, Ahmed, uh, and uh, thank you, Charles, for taking time out uh, of uh, social distancing uh, to be with us <laughs> today. Uh, we enjoyed this conversation and uh, be safe. Uh, same thing to uh, people who are watching this program. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.